for the opportunity to be in this place tonight, Lord God, to give you thanks and praise and to honor you with the fruit of our lips, Lord God, making a joyful noise. Have your perfect way in this place, Lord God. Teach us to be faithful and fearless stewards of all that you have entrusted to us, Lord God, tonight. Amen. When 
darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm standing in your love And my fear doesn't Stand the chance when I stand in your love and my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. No, my There's power that can empty out a grave. And there's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. Oh, there's power that can break off every chain. And there's power that can empty
all my days I have been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I leave my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I hear me blow I will say of the goodness of God love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing Of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running Surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Lord, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I hear me blow, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Give you everything.
Jesus, for your goodness towards us. Thankful for your goodness that pursues us. Help us tonight as we meet in your name, Lord God, to, to surrender ourselves to that goodness and mercy that we might see you more clearly, that we might follow more nearly. Have your way in this place, we pray, Lord God. Thank you, Pastor Todd. Thank you, Kim. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen? Always is. All the time. Automatically. That's good. All right. We want to have some prayer requests this evening. One of the prayer requests of the evening. What is going on around you, in you, as I always usually joke, because of you? What's, what's happening there? Sometimes all three of those apply to me. Anybody, anybody this evening? Yes, Jeff Daniel. Yeah, this uh, lady is weeping. We know really well over uh, taking her uh, husband. Just had an open heart surgery, and uh, she's stressed out pretty bad. Oh, I bet. So she's going through. Okay. So uh, somebody that you know, waitress's uh, husband, and uh, I have a friend of mine that just had open heart surgery and. Had a 70% blockage, and they cleaned that out, and uh, his name is Len. Len is improving. That's good to know. But uh, yeah, he's been those healthy as a horse guys that just all of a sudden caught up to him. So we'll pray for Len at the same time we pray for this lady's husband. Anybody else? Yes, Ann. Baseball accident. Amy. My neighbor that lives in Central Park, David Canelli, Canelli. We're going to go over again on Saturday. They're, they're texting me now. When are you coming over and pray with us again? So I love that. So Praise the Lord. We're going to go over on Saturday at some point. And then you said, what was it, David? David Canelli. Yeah. Okay. He's got, he has yeah. a spinal very aggressive spinal. It's wrapped around his neck, he said. Okay. And he's not walking the other day. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Yes. Understand. It's been a long time since I had finals. I think they still wrote them on stone tablets when I was taking them, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. A friend of mine back home, she was five and had a spinal cord injury. Okay. Yeah. Friend of Neil's dad. Neil's dad. We'll say we'll go around. Father in law. Thankfully, no matter how bad I mangle it, God still knows. I, yeah. Hopefully, I won't, but God still knows. Anybody else? Yeah, Kathy. I have a praise uh, report for my dad. Okay. Uh, we prayed about him someday, and uh, it was returning, and the fluid continued much better. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's good. For the best. Christine, did you have your hand up? Oh, there's the prayer report. Okay, that's good. Prayer because I had a job interview today and mm -hmm. they offered me the job right on the spot. So, wow. Door just opened wide. So, because I went in praying, God, if it's your will, then let it happen. If not, then no big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So, just pray that I can juggle everything. Because it's going to be another thing to do. So, you don't have enough things to do. You'll, you'll, you'll hit that limit at some point. 
Yes, Fred. I start weekly treatment and then I'll do follow up and one or two weeks later. Okay. Okay. We'll believe that those weekly treatments do all the good things and the, none of the bad things, right? Yeah. Amen. Yes, Mike. And Brenda. Okay. And it's good that God knows when we don't. You know, God is not up there great. If you haven't described it well enough, I can't do it. That's good to know He's better than that. My mom went, and they didn't sound terrified, but they did schedule her for an upper and lower GI. I told them, don't get the things knotted in the middle. That's, that would be bad. But she's bleeding somewhere, and they're not sure where. So they put her on some medicine because her, you know, she's, she's dropping down into the anemia range again, and, and like I said, she just got out of the basement back in uh, March. So, um, yeah, we don't know. We're, you know, mom seemed to be pretty confident God's going to take care of it, but, you know, she's just, she's not gone back to the sleeping all the time thing, which has happened to her a couple of times. Praise the Lord, she's not that far down, but, uh, yeah, we got to find what the problem is. So, thanks for praying for her. She appreciates that. Anybody else? All right, you've given, yes, Christine. So you, you, you bent something in your foot or whatever it was, and now they have to straighten it out? They're going to take the hardware out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Grind out some of my bones all over the whole place for that. Wow. Well, it's like going to the bump shop and having put in a Bondo patch. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm not making fun of Richard. Richard and I get along real well. He did, I figured he'd get tough. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Lord Jesus, there are so many different needs tonight. Uh, Lord, I, I'm probably not near smart enough or skilled enough to get them all, but Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter. I know you know all of them. I'm not saying the needs don't matter. They all matter. I'm just saying my skill or anybody else's memory in here is not the point. So God, I ask you that you'd be with Elise. Let her study well. Do well tonight. Do, ex just excel on the final tomorrow. I ask that you minister to Bree, that Lord Jesus, you would heal this cold, this throat thing, and let it just stop moving around the family. Let it be done. Let them get healthy. Let them move on. Lord, I ask you to minister to Fred. Six weeks of treatment. Lord, follow up from the work he had done earlier. God, I pray that this treatment does all of the good things that it's meant to do and nothing bad that's possible. Just lift Fred up and let this be a return to normalcy in all ways for him. God, I ask you to touch Richard. They've got to go pull out hardware and grind, and that, that just sounds like such an intensely physical process. I ask you to minister to Richard. I ask you to ease the pain. I ask you that you would just do wonderful things. Lord, you know, taking care of the foot, letting it serve him long and well after this. Let him recuperate quickly. God, I'm so glad that Kathy's dad has improved in his eating. I just ask you that you continue to do that, that you continue to lift up his health and, and guide him. Every day that, Lord, somebody is here, I pray that, Lord, you give that a good day. Lord, I pray for Neil's father-in-law back in Australia. We ask you to minister to him. Lord Jesus, they put him on palliative care. That's him saying, I can't fight it anymore, or the doctor saying, we have no more answers. But God, if you're going to take Neil's father-in-law and you're going to take him home to heaven, then, Lord, I pray that he knows you and his life is, is anchored in you, that he's ready to make the trip. And if it's not time, then I ask you to restore him and do a miracle, Lord, that no doctor thinks could happen. Lord, I ask you to give Neil and the rest of the family wisdom and, Lord Jesus, patience and grace. Lord, I know that even though I didn't say it today, Pastor Doug with his father and his father-in-law, Lord Jesus, both dealing with different cancers. And, Lord, they continue to ask for wisdom as caregivers. We ask you for minimal or no pain on the part, Lord Jesus, of, of both men. Lord, we pray that Roger would come to know you, If because I'm not sure that he does, that he would come to know you. But Lord Jesus, he'd be ready, Lord, whether he lives another 30 years, or Lord Jesus, whether he's going to go home. We ask that you minister to him, and there would be that spiritual change as well as the physical change. God, I ask you to touch Mr. Penale, Lord. Minister to him, Lord. Huge issues. 
Yeah, I think it's exciting that they're wanting, they're ready for Amy and the team to come pray for him. Lord, I pray that you would minister, that you would remove this terrible cancer, the tumors that are there. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I ask you that you would make, Lord, absolutely whole. God, I ask you that you would touch this issue with this waitress's husband. Lord, this guy has the heart surgery, Jeff. We just ask you that you minister to him. He's got an open heart surgery. I, I mentioned my friend Len Kuchkowski, same thing. He just got out. This gentleman's just getting ready to go in. Lord, I pray that in both cases, the recovery is complete, that the job is dealt with, that, Lord, that there is no more heart problem to deal with either one of these men, but they would be able to go on to help. God, I ask you that you administer the Lord to Phil as he goes to his cardiologist. We ask you to continue to give that cardiologist wisdom. Lord, let there be a, a way, an easy way, Lord, that, that, or even better, a miracle that it's not necessary for there to be a way, that, that Lord, this aphid would stop and that Phil would be whole. And I ask you that Nolan would just know that you were right there, that you were with him. We ask you to touch a 16-year-old that had a baseball incident, Lord, and his eye has been heavily impacted. They don't even know if they can save it. We ask you to bring the swelling down. We ask you to miraculously begin to restore, Lord, the eye, the orbital bone structure around it. Lord, that you do. Lord, this would, I think a lot of times we'd think this is a career-ending, life-changing type of a, an injury. But, Lord, you can, be, you can make it better. And Lord, we ask you that you do amazing things. God, I ask you to touch Christine. In your mighty name, Lord, she has the opportunity to have a job offered to her. That's a wonderful thing. She's trying to figure out how to fit everything on the schedule, make it happen. Lord, I ask you to give her wisdom to know what to do, how to do it, what's best. Lord, if it's all meant to work together, let it work together. If something has to change, help her to know what changes. God, I ask you that you bring blessing and ministry in her life, her schedule, her wisdom. And Lord, as I wrap up, I continue to ask you to touch my mom. I'm thankful that, that you have continue to be with her. I'm glad that the doctors didn't rush her off to the hospital. That Lord, instead, they, they seemed to think that there was time to get on this. And Praise the Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray this is terribly minor, that you would lift her up and just continue to bless her with good health. Father, I thank you for all these things. And for whatever I've forgotten to drop, John and Brenda, Lord Jesus, we ask you that you would touch John and Brenda. Thank you for a, a voice from heaven from the back. Let's go Lord, I ask you that John and Brenda, Lord, they're having an 87 and 84. They have very real issues with their health. And Lord, they're just, they're just not feeling well right now. I ask you to raise them up. I ask you that wisdom in their, again, their doctor team would be able to point to healthy directions. I pray that you would give them, Lord, strength in their body. I pray that they would know that you are with them. Lord, that Mike hear good things coming from his folks. We ask all these things in your mighty and holy name. Amen. Thank you for that help, Kathy. I appreciate that. Couple of things to let you know. We are, we in our last men's ministries meeting, we were trying to determine what the best, you know, first week, second week, third week, fourth week sort of an arrangement was. We've decided on first and third. However, I think there was some misunderstanding about what that constituted, the first full week or the first, you know, partial week. Anyway, I think probably it works out best if we try to do it tomorrow. I don't know how many don't, uh, how many of you can do it tomorrow. So please contact me, email me, talk to me on the way out. This is a fellowship night. We talked about the possibility of going bowling at Brighton Bowl. They have open bowling all the way to 11 o'clock from 5 to 11. And uh, we can get a lane for like 30 bucks for an hour and, and you know, shoes are three bucks. And if you want to bowl, we can do that. Otherwise, we can sit around and just play euchre. That'll work too. You know, I mean, it's okay. It's, you know, it's just a fellowship night, a time together. So if you are interested in coming, please let me know. I'll try to get something on Facebook. But I was going to do that last night. Things just got away from me and I didn't get it done. So my apologies. So it should be tomorrow night. And then secondly, we are looking, especially for our prayer team, we are looking to put an inter-church prayer walk together. Um, at, on uh, It's either going to be September the 30th which is a Saturday, or October the 14th. And some of that's just going to depend on all the other churches. And we just want to walk around the Howell area and pray that God would minister to churches and schools and other things. And we haven't got the whole exact boundaries of the zone set up or anything else. We just know that's about the time. It's going to be somewhere in that three-week time period between September 30th and October 14th. 
So it'll be very likely a Saturday, and we'll probably start like right downtown at the Presbyterian Church because it's right downtown. There's just an easy place to park and, and start. So if you'd like to do that, probably we're looking at, uh, I think we said 11 to 1-ish. You know, start with prayer at the church, end with prayer at the church for those who can. For those whose cars aren't someplace else. So if you want to do that and you are part of that prayer ministry, we have Crafting for Community tomorrow night. Okay, so bring big rollers if you're painting planets. No, we're doing planet painting. We need somebody with long enough to get roll up the paint balls to paint. Okay, okay. I was just seeing this image of trying to paint an entire planet. So be ready to do that. That will be great. Actually, it does. It does. You ever seen men get a little crazy with uh, rollers and paintbrushes? It can be interesting. What's that? We did a lot of this. In fact, I am thankful for all the help that we had on this. I seem to remember while well, we had some other people help. That if I if I'm missing, I, a lot of you came and you worked a night or two, and I'm really really thankful. But I remember spending a lot of time with Jeff Daniels here painting, especially up on scaffolding, because I really wouldn't let anybody else other than Jeff and Pastor Doug get up there. It was like. That was kind of it. Everybody else made me nervous up there. So, you know, good deal. What's that? Um, no, I just don't want... The, 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 how many of you have ever been up on scaffolding? And there's, there's that rock-solid scaffolding that weighs 9 million pounds and it doesn't move. And you feel like you're on a mountainside. You're good. And then there was this scaffolding that kind of had this... I, I said I could grab a paintbrush. And if I had to do is wiggle my hips... The whole thing would shake from side to side, and I could just paint without. So, and up at a certain height, as Jeff can tell you and Pastor Doug can tell you, you couldn't use the top railings, so you're just on that platform. And as you're painting, you have to remember where are my feet, where are my feet, where. Because you don't want to fall, you know, 20 feet, 10 feet, whatever. You still want to fall on the, on the cement floor. So I was a little picky on who I'd let go up there. Um, I trusted those of us who were doing it. What's that? <laughs> We're expendable? No. no. Well, I had several people tell me, you should have a safety line. No, no, no. If I fall, it's just going to pull the whole thing down on top of me. Let's just leave it alone. All right. We are in Romans chapter 14 and verse 14. Now, as we've talked this through, I was looking, there is actually between verse 14 and 23, even though some of this material is the, obviously the carry-on of where we were last week, right? And the week before that, kind of dealing with the weak and the strong and matters of doubtful importance where, you know, some people have strong uh, convictions about certain activities, certain ideas, certain bits of worship, others don't. Um, how this, There's a lot to this. So forgive me if I do a little unpacking. I'm not trying to uh, uh, be too picky uni here, but I, I think it, it deserves a, a dig. Verse 14, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Er, stop. Told you I wouldn't get very far. How many of you know this doesn't mean that sin is not sin? This doesn't mean that they, remember, there are things that are always right. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, faith, that is always good. There is no situation that you can be in where self-control is bad. There's no situation that you can be in that patience is bad. You know, th these are always good things. There are others, but that's just kind of a neat beginning kernel to say, always, always clean, bright, morally pure. On the other hand, how many of you know there are things that it's kind of hard to come up with a situation in which murder is good? Kind of hard to come up with a situation where infidelity is good, lying is good, greed is good. Kind of hard to even imagine that. I've heard some people do verbal gymnastics trying to paint a picture in which that is good. However, it usually if, it, if you have to explain it that long, it's like a joke. If you have to explain the joke, it's not a joke. If you have to explain the morality of a thing that long, it wasn't moral to begin with. We're not talking about that stuff. We're not talking about the always right, that of course is always clean and pure, and we're not talking about things that are always universally bad. But of the things in the middle, the things we've been talking about for a couple of Wednesday nights, those things of doubtful nature, doubtful criticality, 
It says, there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, how many of you realize this is not the answer that most of us would like? How many of you like nice, clear lines? Everything on this side is good, everything on this side is bad, right? You, you just want to know. All I have to do is stay on the right side of the line, and, and my, my actions, my choices, my desires are, are fully justifiable. We're good. This would seem to indicate, as we talked about last week, that convictions are a little bit different than that. Now, the reason I bring this up is because it was, it's kind of easy to look at somebody's convictions and just say, well, you feel that way, big deal, get over it. Right? Remember the weak and the strong? The strong say, my salvation is totally based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There, it doesn't matter what else I do. It doesn't matter whether I follow Jewish holidays. It doesn't matter whether I have certain dietary rules. It doesn't matter if my dress or something else is, is changed or, or regulated in some way by Scripture. It doesn't matter. Except here Paul is saying, well, yeah, it kind of does. Now, Paul isn't doubting the efficiency, the effectiveness of Jesus' salvation, and he's not adding other things to it. He's just saying that to some degree, the way you approach the issues of life and the faith and belief you have about them, it has an effect on what it does to you. For instance, if you think something is bad, somebody name an issue that, as far as you know, is of doubtful importance. You, go into the movies. How many of you remember back in the day when you couldn't go to any movie other than an obviously Christian movie? If it wasn't done by Jesus Christ Movie Corporation, or, I'm kidding. You know what I mean? It had to be, obviously, and it's an altar call, and, and there's a cross. I mean, you couldn't go. It was bad. Okay? So none of those, you know, this is the funny thing. Once upon a time, we used to think Disney films were safe. <laughs> Good luck with that. Anyway, you know, it wasn't that long ago, I know, you know. So, so I remember when uh, Escape to Witch Mountain came out, and you know, ah! you know, I was like, what was that? So, I mean, right, so going to movies. All right. So if you feel that you should not go to movies, if you have this guilt reaction inside, this pressure that says, I really shouldn't be here, this could compromise my testimony, do you just say, well, it doesn't matter, and I need to blow past it? Or do you need to say, I'm not going to go to movies? According to this, you don't go to movies. Why? Because something in you, you feel that this is unclean. Now, where a lot of Christians don't stop is they want to make everybody else not go to movies too, right? We talked about that last week. If I can't go, well, you certainly shouldn't go either. Because it must be the same for everybody. Not really. So, what happens to you if you plow past it? What happens if you feel that something is wrong but you see other Christians that can do it, so you're going to just go. You're just going to do it. What happens to you over time when you carry that out? Your heart gets hardened. Ooh, you don't feel the conviction as much anymore. It's not such a big deal. All right. Has that ever happened for anything else? I mean, you know I always go back to this just because it's funny and it just seems to be no big deal. How many of you have ever heard, well, you don't necessarily have to follow the traffic speed signs, you just have to drive with the traffic. And there's even some sense in that, right? I mean, if you, I annoy people. I get in, I set it at 70, if 70 is it, that's as fast as I'm going to go. And I don't care if 500 people are lined up behind me, I'll stay in the right lane, but I don't care if they're in a hurry, I just don't care. I'm going 70, that's what I'm supposed to do, don't care. Now, I know that some of you, I've actually had Christians sometimes go, who's holding up the line? And they find out it's their pastor, and they tell me about it later. Oh, it's you. Okay, how many of you know that's probably annoying for people who, yeah, I could go 80, everybody else is going 80. But let's say you do that, and pretty soon 80 isn't, or 70 isn't really a number. It's just kind of, how, it's a suggestion. It's kind of how fast I want to go, right? And, and then, well, but I'm in control. I'm fine. I'm not weaving. I have driven in the car with people I know love Jesus. I know they're going to heaven. I know that, not doubting their spirituality, but they are so in the suggestion mode 
that 95 miles an hour is neither unheard of or even abnormal. They're trying to get to heaven quicker. They're trying to get to heaven quicker. Okay. So, so now what happens? Now, you, do I look at these people and think, you have spiritually lost in your hellbound? No. But obviously, that doesn't mean the same anymore, right? The, the, the 55, eh, 70, eh, you know what I mean? It's just, I'm under control. I feel good about my driving. I'm not in everybody's way. It just kind of becomes less and less important to worry about that boundary. Now, again, not a big deal. You're not going to heaven or hell. You just might get there quicker, as you said. It's kind of a thing. Is it true that you can do that with other things? What if God gives you a conviction that you shouldn't play cards? Obviously, this church, but pretty much everybody plays cards. And, 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 and so does your pastor, and it's not a big deal, okay? I, I don't, this is not one of my convictions that you have. When did he grow that one? No, it didn't. We're, we're good. But let's say you felt cards were bad, and you started playing, and you started playing, and you started playing. You know, after some point, you might get yourself in a situation where you were playing the wrong kind of cards for the wrong kind of stakes in the wrong kind of situation, Right? And God sometimes, as I said, puts convictions in your life, sometimes to protect you, sometimes to protect the people that are around you. And so we shouldn't simply say, well, that's a weakness, I need to get over it. We should say, this is a boundary that for some reason the Holy Spirit's drawn in my life at this time. And this passage, Romans 14, 14 says, if it's unclean to me, it's unclean. I shouldn't do it. Now, I will say, is there ever a moment that that could change? How many of you have exactly and precisely the same convictions that you had when you were 16 years old age? If you're in this room and you're 17 years of age, and I think we're all, you know, even Ben is older than that. So, right? I mean, then you go, yeah, no. How many of you have had a couple of decades full of by between 16 and now? And you've learned some things and you've changed some things and some stuff that you can do now or that you've stopped doing now that you used to do then. Your ideas can change. Yeah, Kathy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love it. That's great. I wised up. That's awesome. Okay. Next verse. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. This hits Americans a lot harder than I think almost any other nationality of people on the planet. Why? <laughs> I wasn't even going there, but okay. We do like food. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we can make ourselves a stumbling block. And we don't want to be a stumbling I mean, how many of you wake up in the morning and say, I am going to make somebody stumble today? No, I mean, come on. We're, we're, you know, even if you're having an off day, you're not generally a, a jerk on purpose. You know, I mean, it's not what you want. What is it about being a, an American other than our love for food? And some people would say I love for cheese because cheese goes on everything. If I could figure out a way to put cheese on my Cheerios, I'd probably do it. But, I mean, other than that, what is it about being an American that makes this verse hard? Personal. It's my rights. I have my rights. I'm saved. Does it matter if I eat that food? Don't I have a right to eat the food? I should eat the food. And how, who are you to tell me that I can't eat my food? Why should you weakling have a veto authority over me? I'm an American. I'm a free human being. I sh we are real big on that. There are places in the world where people will line up for hours to do things, and we'd be like, not happening here. We don't like to be told where to go. Now, you're all going, what? Come on. We don't really like, just like back to the speed limit thing, that's why it's a suggestion. We're going to get to that in just a couple of verses. No, good question. Please don't forget it. 
but I don't, okay, I don't want to jump on it right now. And how many of you know that anybody that tells you that you need to do it their way and tells you you're in, that you're intolerant because you don't do it their way is absolutely technically being intolerant, right? I mean, they're just saying, you have to do it my way if it's the only way. It's kind of human problems. Can't tolerate it. <laughs> Can't tolerate it, right. So don't destroy it. Now that puts it in a totally different perspective, doesn't it? I could say, this is my right, that is my right, I should be allowed to do this, I should be allowed to do that. But we're not usually thinking about the damage that we do. If I, and I used this before, I don't, when I say I don't care, I'm not saying I, I'm not interested in your, your spiritual future or the, the moral rightness, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, not my circus, not my monkeys. If your convictions allow you to have a beer with dinner, have a beer with dinner. Not my problem, okay? I'm not judging you. But if you sit down with a beer at dinner and you see somebody start to struggle and they're asking, well, I, I should be able to do this too, imagine they become an alcoholic. Now, that's an iffy situation. Is it your fault? Well, no. But if you know somebody has a problem with that, is that the loving thing to do? I mean, you can say, in all honesty, I can drink this, and I know I'm not going to make God mad, and I'm not going to go to hell, and I'm not addicted to it. Yay, team! But if I exercise my right to do this in front of that person, there's a possibility they could be really messed up. Is this beer worth that? See, that changes the nature. If it's all about my rights, of course, I should be able to do whatever I want to do. If it's about the good of other people, then maybe I shouldn't, right? It's kind of, it's a, that's easier, back to the speed limit thing. It's easier to understand a 25 mile an hour zone in a neighborhood with children at play signs than it is on I-75 or I-96, right? I mean, we're in a limited access expressway, you, know, you have lanes, there's not a lot of traffic, a lot of places outside the big cities. It's a lot harder to buy it there. But when you see the damage it can do, you know, driving 50 in a neighborhood is just irresponsible. Stop it. Okay? It, it, it's slow down. So that means that there may be places where you are legitimately free to go on your own. Your pastor, your spouse, you know, we're not saying that you're not. But there are times when you need to limit your freedom for the good and benefit of others. Now, I know there's a thought that always arises in my mind. Maybe you are all way too noble to have this thought cross your mind. I am not, so I have to admit. How many of you have ever heard a verse like this and said, well, should the weaklings be able to set the tone forever? <laughs> yeah, the offended, the angry, should they be able to set the tone, change the language, do whatever they want to do? Well, we'll see. Obviously, we do understand that there is a place when somebody is not attempting to set the tone, Right? I tell you, you can't do this. You can't dress this way. You can't drink that. You can't eat that because I am offended. How many of you know most of the time that's an attempt at control? It's not really an attempt at this is righteous and I'm really having temptations and problems with it. It's I want to control you. And if you spend any amount of time with that person, how many of you know usually that pops out? And that, then your analysis of the situation can begin to change a little bit. Not saying you should shove it in their face, but your way to pray about it, think about it, analyze it does change because you know that it's not really the issue that bothers them, it's the control behind the issue. Yeah? Okay, then the whole idea of science and nonetheless it moves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. I'm looking through the telescope and the earth goes around the sun. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely true. Well, that a good historical uh, connection. 16. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. <sighs> I'm going to make an assumption. I think it's a fair assumption. 
I think that in whether we think about it consciously or, or not, I think that our intention in this room and in many, many other places where Christ is worshipped, right? Many hearts where Christ is How many of you say, well, basically, I want to do the right thing. Basically, I, I want to live. I, I'm not trying intentionally to do it wrong. You know, yes, I get tempted. Yes, I do stupid things at times, but I'm not attempting to tear down the world. I, I, I want to do the right thing. How many of you would say, well, that's generally a good thing? It's a good thing. Yes, I agree. Is it possible to be so heavenly minded you're of no earthly good? Yeah, we're, we're in your way of looking at your convictions, in your way of deciding what the Holy Spirit has asked you to do. You begin to shove that into everybody else's face. <sighs> that makes our good turn out to be spoken of as evil. Now, again, the world is increasingly not in favor of us anyway. How many of you have noticed that sea change? You know, not necessarily. And, and we'll get to that in a few verses too. But, but again, it, it's, it's wonderful to do good things, but to do them in a way that it causes everybody else to react negatively when maybe it's our attitude, not the action. How many of you know that you living a faithful life shouldn't bother anybody else? It's your choice. You're faithful to your spouse, you're faithful to your kids, you're faithful to your promises to your friends. You're, why should that bother anybody else? But when you get in everybody else's face telling them how they need to be faithful, that is likely to cause a reaction. You might be right, but it's going to cause a reaction. Yeah. Does that say no good thing goes unpunished? No, no good thing goes unpunished? Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. People, so, so we have to be careful how we live out the good we want to do. Next verse. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. How does the, how does the uh, Amplified say Is there any addition? I just, I know sometimes there's really good add -ins. 17. Okay, so, so let, let me give you a, what to me is a personal and good illustration of this. I run in a lot of social circles, obviously. Church is like the one I run in most of the time. But I, I do have other social circles that I run in. And there are a reasonable number of people in those social circles who have absolutely no relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you know at least a few of those people out there somewhere? In your family, in your neighborhood, in your, your work, or whatever. Okay, and... I know people that are gay. I know people that are, you know, tr transitioning as, you know, unsure about their gender. I, how many of you ever met anybody like that, too? Now, somebody's going to watch this video later and say, yeah, 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 I don't care. How many of you realize that the Bible does not say those things are good? How many of you realize? I love the argument where they say, well, Jesus never said anything about trans people. There weren't any! The Bible covers it in, in saying that you should not wear clothes that apply to the other gender. It says that, the Old Testament. Jesus came to fulfill the law, and he, so he wasn't going to say, eh, forget that one. You know, I mean, it just it wasn't talked about. How many of you know that in Greek culture, homosexuality was relatively common? I mean, you might not be, and you might not, but there were people who were. And, and y'all knew that, especially a lot of the politicians and the rich people. There were issues there. But how many of you in Hebrew culture, that was a no-no. I, I don't care if you were super observant as a Jew or you were just part of the culture. If you were, you were way in the closet if that was your, you did not admit to that. So in what possible sense was Jesus ever going to come out and clearly preach against something that was not happening in the culture visibly? That we would, we're trying to make the assumption that Jesus is going to make a ruling on every possible human interactivity that would ever take place in history. And if you want to know, the Old Testament was very clear about homosexuality. And then Paul later would be very clear about it in the New Testament. So there's really no issue here. 
okay? But how many of you know that the kingdom of God is not about yelling at people who are gay or trans? Well, pastor, are you saying it's... I didn't say it was all right. I very clearly started with the scripture says this. If you are somebody or you know somebody that is trying to get close to God, that wants to get close to God and is struggling with same-sex attraction, should you pray for them? Should you encourage them? Should you try to lead them in the right direction? If they ask you if it's right or wrong, should you point them to the scriptures that show them that it's wrong? Yes, yes, and yes. Should you go into a public setting and get in somebody's face that doesn't know Jesus, isn't interested in being covenant with Jesus, and tell them that they're going to hell because they're gay? They're going to hell because they don't know Jesus. Where they put their parts is not the issue for heaven and hell. It matters... For self-declared believers walking in covenant, we should do it right. I hope there's no disagreement with that in here. If there is, you're wrong. Anyway, we'll go on. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we got to be really careful, right? So I know people in my circles that go through this. Now, on the extremely rare occasion where they have floated a question my way, I'm going to kindly say and have kindly said, well, this is what the Bible says about it, and this is my authority. This is why I believe what I believe. But I don't feel the need to lecture them and yell at them all the time. Why? The kingdom of God is not mainly about where you put your junk. Sorry if that's offensive. I'm just trying to be put straight out. Any more than it was about eating bacon. Any more is about having tassels on your garments. Any, any more is whether you celebrate the right feast on the right day. Or you ate meat sacrificed to pagan idols. That wasn't what it's about. What is it about? Righteousness. Well, there's the first part, right? Where we were concerned about doing it right, about having an internal personal standard that follows Jesus' example. I am too. Righteousness means doing things correctly according to the law of God, the principles of God. So I'm not going to champion choices that are obviously against God. Not wise. That's important. Peace. How many of you know getting in other people's faces and yelling and screaming and shaking fists does not generate peace? Yeah? Please? How do I deal with people at work? Sure. In this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And our boss is expecting us to be a certain way when it comes to certain restaurants. And they want to be called a certain pronoun. Because it's deranged. But anyway, go ahead. But, but how does that affect? Because I, I go along with it because it's what my boss is expecting yeah. me to do. Like, there's no issue. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it's bothering me. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be dealing with it. Because I can get in trouble if I'm not. Okay. You know, sometimes I'll see dumb uh, stuff with like children or uh, right. stuff and you just can't really get into it. Well, let me give you, and I've said enough today to get me condemned from a half a different circles, but how, how, many of you, how many of you know the story of Naaman? In the Old Testament. Yeah. General from Syria. Mm -hmm. And he comes over and didn't God actually, didn't a slave girl that he owned tell him he needed to go see the prophet? And he goes to see the prophet. And the prophet says, go bathe in the river. And he goes and bathes in the river he's made whole. And he comes back. There's other things in between and the judgment and whatever. But he comes back at, at the end and he's talking to Elijah and he, and he says, please forgive me in this. When I go back home, and my master goes into the temple of Mizraq as God, and I go in and I kneel down next to him. And Elijah says, go in peace. Now, how many of you know that that is idolatry? You've been healed by God Almighty. Why would you? Well, that's his job. He's the main general for the king. Notice Elijah doesn't say, quit the army, don't do this anymore. Now, we could argue about that all day, but how many of you know that's not what it says? Don't make the Bible say Elijah wasn't saying, idolatry is cool, you get a free pass. What he heard was his heart. Naaman was saying, I don't believe in that anymore. I believe in this God who turned me from a leper into a whole man. But I've got this job thing I've got to do. And it's not killing people. And it's, I mean, well, he predicted that in his job anyway. But, I mean, you know what I mean? And Elijah said, go in peace. So, in this situation, obviously, if you were at the point where you said, I can't handle this anymore... I'm going to lose it if I have to continue to do this. Then 
as hard as the answer would be, the right thing would be to find another job where you could do differently. And, you know, no, I'm not trying to get your wife to quit her job, Pastor. I'm just, right? I mean, if you cannot sit in peace because you're forced to do something. On the other hand, I have a member of my family who is female, has chosen to change her name to a male name. I call her her name. I mean, her changed name. How many of you have a name is just a name? You call yourself garbage can if you want to. I mean, whatever you want, it's just a name. Do I agree with her thoughts behind it? Well, no, I don't. But I'm not going to be in purpose, on purpose and plight. I don't need to be. You know, righteousness, peace, and the whole, joy in the Holy Spirit, the, the kingdom of God is not whether she uses a name I think she should use or not. So that's not the solution maybe you want, but, yeah. It's hard. So are, are, are there lines, and I'll catch you in a second, Phil. Are there lines? Yes. Again, back to convictions. There may be people who say, I simply cannot go there. And it's not because I'm mad at them or I hate them. I, I really feel the Holy Spirit is telling me I cannot go there. Then the only thing you can really do in that situation and keep your job, well, you could. You have to leave your job, right? It, or, or ask to have a job that somehow doesn't deal with patients in the same way, and I don't think those exist where you are. But if it's not a, a Holy Spirit-driven, and you know that you know this is what you're supposed to do, then treating somebody with courtesy and following the, the parameters... It's just hard. It's just weird. Yeah. 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 As long as you, I can see this. This is what I want to say. They and them are each of you paying the same bill or only one? Yeah, right. Right. It, It, it does become silly. Phil had something. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. It's not my, not my circus, not my monkeys. Yeah, right, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they're going to live on this earth as long as he allows them to do that. Yep. And as we've seen in the Bible, uh -huh. once in a while he reaches out and does away with them, too. Right, yeah. that, yes, that's going to happen. Yeah. You never know. I mean, I think I still show up in both places. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's not that much, I might add. It's not been that long, right? No, it's, it's, it's a. Okay, so righteousness, peace, and joy. Think about how those things drive you. If you're living the right way for God, it, within the, con the convictions you have, the understanding of Scripture, and again, that will change. The Holy Spirit can help you understand things that you didn't understand before. Great, cool. And peace can't come from wholeness. Yes, completeness, wholeness, right. 
And that, that's a good thing. So you're, you're not desperate for something that you don't have. And enjoy that thing. It's not just the happiness, the froth at the top, but that deep abiding understanding that I am who I am supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be. That's the kingdom of God. That's what it's about. Next verse, 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God. I told you I'd get to this one. And approved by men. Let me show you what's a little different in history. How many of you know that a, a group that is a minority will tend to behave itself differently than a group that's had power and is losing it? And there is the story of Christianity in America. When you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament, you look at the early part of the church, how many of you know that there weren't thousands and thousands, of, not at this point, of Christians running around? You know, you weren't bumping into Christians every day. Christians existed. In some places, they were very much underground and persecuted and sometimes killed. That tended to be fairly limited or during limited times in the Roman Empire and places. But it did exist. And then what happened was, how many of you realize that they just focused on living the life Jesus gave them? They were trying to vote, change the government, change the morality of everybody else by legal action. They didn't try that. They knew they couldn't. All they could do was live for Jesus themselves. They had no power other than that. Their power was over their own choice. Now that's why it says, he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God. Oh yeah, we're doing what God wants. That's good. And approved by men. Think about it. If you become, if your ethics get better, if you don't cheat in your relationships and on your job, if you pay your debts, you know what I mean? If you're honest in your speech, what makes you worse to people? I mean, think about that. You know, there, there's a sociological thing called you know, Christian uplift that's happened in all kinds of cultures where there's been hopeless moral chaos. And all of a sudden, people start to get saved. And life changes. And, you know, in the beginning, it's a wonderful thing. What happens, though, after a while, when Christians begin to have a sense of power and entitlement, that we now have a right to violate Romans 13 and 14 and tell other people how they have to behave because it's our job to protect God's interests in this world. And we start pushing that. And if you look at the history of Europe, you had a time period, right, where literally tribes were told at the point of the sword, you are now Christian, and you will be baptized, and you will go to this church, and you will do what you're told. And they were killed or baptized and became Christians. How many of you know they weren't any more Christians in the chair you're sitting in? But they were told what to do. And eventually, they found ways to push back. The problem is, is when Christians start losing that power, that authority, that control, which happened, started happening a long time ago in American, you know, American story, we, we are really uncomfortable with that. I'm not saying bad people are. We get uncomfortable with that, right? Because there's a way we see our world that we want it to work. And we have a really hard time when it feels like that is falling out of our control. How many of you know it was never supposed to be in our control? It's supposed to be in his control. That's why when you pray for the nation, it matters. We're asking God to show. He's already got control of it, but to show, to evidence, to bring changes. Now, am I telling you as a citizen that you shouldn't vote or you shouldn't care? Nope. You go out, you vote your conscience, you do what God asks you to do in the ballot box. You should always do that. That's your civic responsibility and your spiritual responsibility. But at the end of the day... Society will sometimes make decisions that are really not in agreement with us. In the end, you can't make them mind God. All you and I can do is decide to mind God ourselves. You understand? I'm not saying roll over and be a doormat. I am saying we can't enforce our Christian morality by law and power over other people for very long. Either they come into the covenant... They join the family, and they choose to live this life, or they will find a way to push back. So in this case, we're literally told, when we do what is right, when we manage ourselves according to the power of the Holy Spirit, when we lo look at righteousness, peace, and joy, what is not to like? 
your neighbors will find. They might not agree with everything you believe. That's true. But how do they find you all that offensive? You're actually better people for it, and so am I. So we become approved by men. One of the reasons that persecution in the Roman Empire against Christians stopped was because they literally said, look, it doesn't matter how many of them we, we kill. They're doing good things. How can we keep selling it? We give up. Bill. This is the thing about the definition of career. That yeah. We went through big time in Seattle because we went to the 80s. We brought in and they gave you mirrors to explain to people that there's a reason why we have mirrors brought in because there are children involved. Yeah. And they have to be protected. Yeah. And if we can't protect them, who's going to? Right. So uh, when you start messing with things like You, you mentioned that. It reminded me. How many of you read the article somewhere in the last, I think it's been the last week, of the guy who married his AI chatbot girlfriend? <laughs> How scary is that? This isn't even a person. This is a computer program. Look at the barriers. Yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> not, not saying what you, what you said made perfect sense. This is why there are people who aren't saying I guess. Just crazy. Michelle. Yeah. That's always been the solution. Yeah, that's always been the solution. How many of you that you've read the Old Testament long enough to realize that even that system, remember that was not God's plan, God, God's first plan, right? The people said, we're not going to go talk, you, you'll kill, God will kill us if we go talk to him. You, you go, Moses, you go get the rules, you come back. And Moses did that. So God gave him rules. How many of you know that those laws and rules really didn't work? And that's not the fault of God. He, was, he said, you want to climb to reach for the brass ring? This is how you got to do it. And they did a terrible job at it because people don't like rules and they, they didn't do well. Yeah. It wasn't even a robot, it was a program. <laughs> Self-partnered, yes. There's a lot of crazy in our society. It just is. Verse 19. I love the fact that you changed that. That was good thinking. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. What does it mean to edify? What? Build up. Encourage, focus, shape, in a positive way. Add a boy, add a girl. Okay? So, so that gives us a different set of marching orders, doesn't it? Our job as believers is to pursue the things that make for peace. Again, we know there's a limitation. Insofar as you, you know, a few verses back, you, you know, last chapter, insofar as you go, try to be at peace with all men. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes they won't let you. But we should certainly aim at it. And we should be aiming at encouraging each other, not blasting each other. Next verse. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And I like food. <laughs> don't, don't, set, don't try to send somebody to hell for small things. Religious things. Is it worth it if you win the argument, but they turn around and hate God forever? Have you really won? No. Like I said, I go back to that idea, because I talked about weaker people being able to veto, and how that doesn't sit well. And, and, you know, where are the moral lines? We don't want to compromise the moral lines. We don't want to, you know, slide over and start accepting all of our culture's garbage in an attempt to, to be nice. We like that nice clean line. Everything on one side is good. Everything on one side is bad. How many of you realize that this life actually requires you to have a connection with God, the connection with God, the Holy Spirit, 
a willingness to be corrected and informed yourself and to live out a life of discipleship because the lines are not always so screaming clear, are they? Sometimes you're looking at people and motivations and whether they're saved or not and what they know and saying, Holy Spirit, can you please show me how to bring this person over to the side while they'll begin to understand and want to do the things which are righteousness, peace, and joy. It, it means we have to be attentive, right? And that's a lot harder. I would rather drive a tank. How many of you know if you get in my way with a tank, it doesn't really much matter? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. There's a traffic jam. Not anymore. Not for me. I have a tank. But if I actually have to pay attention to the cars around me, because I can get hurt and they can get hurt, it helps to be awake. It helps to be attentive. And that's the world we live in. A world where we need to be prayerfully responsive and understanding of what the will of God is at the place and the time that I'm in. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure. Again, that goes back to the disputable issues. All things again are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Meaning, if I know I shouldn't do it, and I choose to do it anyway, I hurt me. Next verse. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Look at that beginning. It is good. The motivation behind limiting your own rights for the benefit of others is a good impulse. I want to help them. I want to drive 25 because there's three-year-olds running. You go down Lone Tree Drive in Milford and you're doing 70, I'll kick your butt because my granddaughter lives on that road. I, I don't want to run over by a church family member. That would be bad. Right? So we need to move into our world and be careful to self-limit when we realize we need to. And be for others. This is, a, yeah, clearly assuming we're dealing with believers. Yeah, okay? So this isn't talking about some person out in the culture is ticked off at you because you're not tolerant enough. That, that's not what that is, very clearly. These are self-identified believers. Next verse. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Think about again, what, what is it we're still talking about? Doubtful things, right? So if your faith tells you, I can't do this, that, and the other thing, have that faith, what is this, to yourself before God. Awkward sentence creation. You know what that means. You live out the convictions God's given you in faith believing he gave it to you for a reason. Yourself. Don't be yelling at everybody else. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Do you think that God wants you to have a confidence about the convictions that are in your own heart? Yeah, because you're trusting him, right? You're saying, Holy Spirit, I should do this. Holy Spirit, I hear that you want me not to do that. And you need to be confident in that. You, isn't it terrible if you're second-guessing yourself all the time? How many of you have ever been in a job where you're constantly second-guessing whether the management likes you or not? Not fun. In a relationship with somebody, you're not sure whether they really like you or not. Not fun. God is not looking to torment you that way. He wants you to have confidence in that. Next verse. But he who, he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay, we're almost done. Great place to stop. It's in the chapter, yeah. I will say one other thing about that. I remember a time in my own life where I knew what I was supposed to do. I've said this before. My testimony, I don't like make it up as I go along. You've all heard this before. So those of you who have can kind of glass off and not worry about it. And the ones that don't. But I knew what I was supposed to do. God had called me into ministry. And I told my mom that God had called me into ministry. And my mom did not forget. And she kept praying for me. And that was like about ninth grade. 
And then the 11th grade, I said, forget that. I'm not even interested in being in ministry. Now, I didn't want to go out and be a drug dealer or, you know, get people pregnant. I mean, I wasn't trying to be a, 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 a terror or anything. I just didn't really want to deal with people that much. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I didn't. I love people. I would go crazy if I couldn't have people with me in my 50s. But as an 18-year-old, not so much. And so I wanted to do anything else, and I went off to college, and I went, and I, like I said before, I tried to find, I knew that I had to go to church somewhere. Because mom and dad were at least paying for some of school that I didn't have scholarships for. And I needed that money. How many of you have ever been to that point you know you need it? I mean, literally, my dad told me once, do you need this? Just like that. I said, yes, sir. Yes, I do. Then you'll do what I tell you to do. <laughs> Got it. So I knew I had to go to church. So I on purpose picked the deadest church I could find. Which around Michigan State, the deadest church I could find was University Lutheran. Now, I don't know. Maybe it's a great church now. At that time, I don't think Jesus had ever been there. And, and I was trying to find, and I have been to Lutheran churches where they love God and they're passionate, and I have Lutheran friends that are as saved or more saved than me. However you want to work that out. I'm not knocking Lutherans. I'm just saying that one, not back in the 80s. Not so much. So I went there on purpose. So I didn't have to feel convicted for anything, and I can still tell my parents, I checked the box, I went to church. Okay? Now, how many of you realize that in that time during college, I was tempted to do things that I knew I should not do? And I would try to warp that verse to justify myself. Well, all I just have to have is faith that God is cool with this thing that I want to do. How many of you see the stupid hole in that logic already? You know, it's like, duh. But you know, you want to do these things. They're the desires of your wicked heart, and you want to do them, and you're trying to find some way to justify them to yourself because you know that you're not eating with faith. You cannot behave in that way and believe God is okay with it. And you're trying to fool yourself. And we are amazingly capable liars to ourselves. And I pushed that and I pushed that. And I did the way God handled it, he started going flick, 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 and knocked all my crutches out from under me. Everything. Everything that worked good. All my arrangements. Now what you gonna do? I didn't, you know, wasn't in the hospital with all busted limbs and no. But all of my support systems that I thought I had planned so well were suddenly gone. And God started to say, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to shut up. I'm going to say Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. He is in heaven and I am on earth. Therefore, let my words be few. You're right, God. I'm an idiot. Please forgive me. See, it never really works to try to get yourself to have faith to do something you know you shouldn't do. Just accept the limit that God has placed between you and him for your life. He's given it to you for a good reason. He loves you. Don't worry about somebody else's limit. Not your circus, not your monkeys. Just acknowledge your own and say, God, help me live there and help me live with faith. I would have done myself way less damage had I been a spiritually smarter human being. I'm just glad that God is gracious and he forgives. So Jesus, here we are. Lord, we live in a complicated world. Lord, I might joke about being older and, you know, I, it's just funny how the, the, the age climbs on you after a while, but the truth is, is the world was a lot simpler or it seemed a lot simpler when I was 18. We live in a complicated world where people do things that are almost inexplicable. And Lord Jesus, it's not always just people out there in the world that don't know you and don't seem to care. Sometimes it's people who go to church every day or every week. And we go, what? You do what? You believe what? Lord, some of that stuff is doubtful. A lot of different training and conviction and past. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Because living through the differences, being sensitive to what your Holy Spirit is telling each one of us to do, very clearly. Knowing what's always right and what's always wrong. Trying to make sure that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit 
He was our motivation. Lord Jesus, that is not an autopilot kind of life. That's one we have to prayerfully pay attention. We have to keep our nose in the word and our ear open for your voice. It's not new. The early church had the same issue. And they made it. In many ways, they changed the world around them through your grace, living out these principles more often than not. Help us to do the same thing in our own world. Lord, not just to say, well, the end is coming and they're all doomed anyway, but instead to say, Lord, you put me here, each one of us, you put us here for a reason. Let us prayerfully walk that reason. In your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, my mom was awesome. Is still awesome. I am so thankful.